What comes to mind when I say there is a 95% biodegradable lighting product on the market? If you're like me, you ask yourself, what the heck? What, what does that even mean? Welcome to Keeping the Lights On. I'm your host, Todd Reed. And in this podcast, I connect with the owners and pros who design, build, and maintain our electrical, communications, and industrial world to explore the best ways forward. My lighting designer spouse, Lisa, brought this very topic, biodegradable lighting, to my attention, and I immediately needed to learn more. So she introduced me to Benjamin Rapkin, general manager at Lightly. He has spent his career in the pursuit of collaborative partnerships in business to solve important problems. And in this case, the problem is bringing sustainable products to construction and, in this, and specifically to lighting. Let's get into the show. We start out each episode with the meals that bring us together. So Benjamin, if I were to visit you, where might you take me and why would you choose this? Oh, wow. That's, that's a tough question in Brooklyn, New York, but uh, a couple places come to mind. For breakfast, we would probably go to bakery. It's spelled with an I instead of a Y at the end. Uh, they have some phenomenal croissants. They have a great backyard garden. Uh, they have these amazing like cheese rolls, but probably the best thing they make every day is fresh sourdough and fresh baguette. So if you want some bread, fresh bread for the rest of your week, uh, it's a great place to go. And then for lunch, we would walk probably up the street to Cafe Mogador, which is a Moroccan Mediterranean restaurant. My favorite thing there is their lamb. It's like a lamb shoulder with couscous. Uh, they also have different tagines and really, really good slow cooked, like kind of just delicious, wholesome food. Uh, and then for dinner, I would recommend Lilia, which is kind of a contemporary Italian. Uh, all I probably need to tell you about that is the first thing you get when you sit down there is a fresh baked loaf of focaccia just for yourself. Uh, and so this is going to be a very carb heavy uh, day for us. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, those sound awesome. Now, I do like it. Uh, you're my second person to now list a place for each breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which I think is awesome. So it's going to be a very uh, food time if I ever come visit. Awesome. But um, So you kind of mentioned something at, uh, you said the bread at bakery. Is there anything else you like to get there besides, you know, just the bread for the week? Oh, yeah. The, they make the best croissants uh, that I have in my neighborhood, which is, you know, I consider my neighborhood maybe like a few square blocks. but. Uh, the, the croissants are amazing. They have play and they have chocolate. They're always good every time. Uh, crunchy and flaky and buttery. So if you're going to get one thing there, I would get that. But they also do biscuits and you can do egg sandwiches. You can have them make stuff for you and sit there and eat it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I would recommend for sure. Wow. Well, the bad thing about this question is I always start to get a little hungry and want to shut this down and go find something good to eat. But um, yeah, Can we wrap this up, Todd? Yeah, exactly. You got lunch coming up. Um, well, I appreciate you listing those. And I, I've started uh, actually putting links if they have a website, which most of them do now. I put a link to their websites in the show notes. So if anybody's in Brooklyn, you can click on the show notes and find those places and uh, go visit and uh, tell them Benjamin sent you. Um, yeah. So as I did, I, I like I said, I like to research the places, you know, that... Uh, you know, because we do a pre-interview and you share those restaurants with me. I like to look into them to see if there's a way to tie them into the topic. And uh, the, the thing that um, we're going to be talking about today is sustainability, biodegradable lighting and uh, construction products. But what I started to get a gather from those places, all, all three websites was consistent, was their care they put into their their product, which is food and the customer experience. So it just kind of got me to uh, thinking about care and construction. And to me, you know, using sustainable products, biodegradable products and a construction project implies a level of care that an owner uh, who's making those really kind of final decisions about what to use in their, their building um, shows a care that they care about saving the resources, reducing impact, you know, both before, during and after construction. Um, and so, and against, in addition, I was, you know, just doing reading to kind of just make sure I understand the topic we're going to be doing today. And I, as I understand that construction demolition seems to be projected to be about 25% of our national waste stream. And, um, so it seems like it's a great way to start thinking about construction, you know, in a new way to 
using sustainable materials to make, make a better impact on our world. So let me just ask you, uh, Benjamin, what is the current state of sustainable construction? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think tying that into food and restaurants is a great analogy because in a way, those are some of the hardest manufacturing businesses to run. They have the shortest lead times from order to shipment, right? And their inventory goes bad faster than than pretty much anyone else. Their margins are tighter. Their customers are sitting right in front of them demanding things, right? So you can draw a lot of analogies. And I love uh, that you focused on food because that's somewhere where we really appreciate care and thoughtful design. We care about what goes into our bodies because, you know, it's very selfish of us to care about that, but it's important. Uh, to to make sure we're putting good things in and we'll get good things, you know, in our in our life, hopefully, if we do that. So to, to draw the analogy, analogy to manufacturing and to answer your question, what's the state of sustainable construction? The first place I would start is the problem. You know, 39 percent of all CO2 emissions globally are the responsible of buildings and building materials. So from the operations of buildings and from the the construction of the building and the building materials. That means that over a third of all the carbon emissions in the world are our are, are industry's responsibility to solve, not just lighting, but construction and architectural product, products in general. The biggest emitters of carbon in a new construction project are the structural materials, steel and concrete. Uh, and there's some interesting innovations there. But in renovation projects where the structure is not being manipulated, Lighting is one of the biggest contributors and HVAC, as you can imagine. And so, you know, there's some, there's some interesting things coming out and, you know, innovations in concrete mixes and steel electric arc furnaces to, to heat steel and shape it instead of coal. Uh, but the innovation I am most excited about in structural materials is mass timber. It is vastly lower carbon emissions than, than concrete and steel. Now, it's not perfect, but there are some really exciting things about it. Uh, and I've now this past year seen with my own eyes several mass timber buildings going up. And that really was inspiring and encouraging and, and gave me energy. However, in lighting, we're way behind the rest of the industry. Um, if you look at, you know, furniture and flooring, they've been scrutinized for their materiality and carbon story for years. Lighting is just kind of figuring out what that even means, let alone uh, solving the problem. Most lighting products are made from some combination of metal and plastic. These are high carbon, toxic materials with toxic uh, manufacturing processes, and they don't really have end of life programs yet. And even if the light, the light fixture itself is made from a, a sustainable or recyclable base material, it often will just end up in the landfill anyway and not be recycled or properly handled. Uh, so, you know, this is a real issue because it means that the lighting industry is not really prepared for the inevitable adoption of sustainable measurement practices and sustainable design. You know, the large, the largest, most influential organizations on the planet all have made commitments to reducing their carbon footprint. And a lot of this is, you know, profit motivated. You know, we more people will shop here if we have a commitment to sustainability. You know what? That's okay. If that's what makes progress, that's great. But if you think about it, the U.S. government, Apple, Google, Nike, Amazon, Walgreens, the Canadian government, European governments all have made 20, 30 or, or somewhere in their carbon commitments. Uh, and the lighting industry isn't really making progress towards that from a material perspective. But I believe, and I think it's very likely to happen, this will become law eventually. Right now, sustainable design is a choice. If you look to our neighbors to the north or across the pond, you'll see that it's code and regulation now. Uh, and I think that's going to come here next. We're always a few years behind. So you did, you know, you mentioned uh, flooring and furniture kind of leading the way. We're going to focus on lighting because that's kind of your focus of your your world right now. Um, so what are some of the struggles in, in the lighting world that that's holding it back? Yeah, so I think the first kind of over overlying problem is a lack of knowledge and understanding. It doesn't take a lot of time 
to build an understanding of what carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases are, what operational versus embodied carbon is. The documentation is probably the most technical piece of it, but really there's only a few different documents that are worth looking at and understanding. I would argue that within an hour of time, you can build the basic understanding of the terminology if you go, if you know where to look, you, know, you go looking in the right places or you get help from the right people. That understanding is critical to translate what I'm putting into the world to tens of thousands of, of subsequent people. And that means that not everyone's getting a direct primary source expert's opinion. And the more educated everyone is, the more accurate information we will proliferate throughout the industry. Now, I think podcasts like this and ways to scale your audience uh, without having to be everywhere are wonderful. And that's part of the reason why I'm so excited to be here is because we can build some more awareness or at least motivation to, to learn uh, through these, these more scalable channels. But that, I would say, is the, the biggest first two problems is there's a lack of understanding and awareness about sustainability in our industry. And then it's hard to build that awareness properly because of the multi-cha- multi-stakeholder channels and supply chain of information. Underlying that, once you get further down in the project cycle, let's say sustainable products have been specified. I would argue that value engineering is one of the biggest challenges that uh, any type of innovation faces in our industry because innovation costs money. That means the product is going to cost some money, maybe more than than another option. And the lighting industry doesn't often reward the more expensive product, even if it is a, a, the right solution. Uh, and that is a big obstacle. Uh, this also has to do with the multi-layered stakeholder supply chain, uh, but it does hinder progress often when something is specified for a particular reason, and then uh, that's removed from the job by somebody else later. Um, the final thing I would mention is the status quo. Uh, the this there's hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of feet of lighting that are all being sold and shipped every day, and all of it is from a metal and plastic supply chain right now. Um, to change those supply chains and to change the tooling and training of the people in the the factory and to change the expectations of what a product should be made of for a certain environment. Those are big uphill battles that are just going to take time and persistence. But as long as we're presenting a good value proposition uh, from the manufacturer's side, it will happen. We just got to keep going. So that's what I would think of as the, the top challenges. One of the things that you mentioned in earlier in the conversation is embodied carbon versus operational. I'll make, uh, I'll give my uh, chance to define it here. If I you could need to correct me, please do. But embodied is basically the products and the things going, the carbon going into the building of it. So like in the lighting fixture, what are you using to build that? The concrete, et cetera. And operational is more running the lighting, running the HVAC. And you know, I'm sure there's a long list in that, but Run actually running the building after construction for the 20, 30, 40 years afterwards. Um, okay, that's cool. Good. Um, <clears throat> it's it's so, a little more comprehensive than that. Like it, it, you could think about it as the energy that's being used and turning into greenhouse gases for each stage of like for embodied carbon. It includes mining the aluminum, shipping it to a place to turn into ingots, shipped and then the heat that's required to turn into ingots, then shipping it to be extruded and the heat that's required to extrude it. So all the energy to transport and shape and extract the material, and then all the way until it leaves the final assembly location as a finished light fixture, that is what creates the total embodied carbon number. And that is presented in the units kilograms of CO2 or equivalent. And so that's the units that it'll be presented. That's also true of operational carbon. That's presented in kilograms of CO2 or equivalent. And you're correct. It's from running the lighting after it's installed, running the HVAC, the electrical systems in a building. Um, and HVAC and lighting are the, the two biggest uh, energy consumers in any building. Okay. Lighting, I think the way I think about it most is in the operational side of things. I, I mean, for years, and that's kind of, you know, we have a lot of efficiencies built because nowadays because of leds right and so doesn't that energy reduction of the operational side of things uh help the cause 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, the progress that our industry has made in energy performance over the last two decades, I mean, I, you're probably a better person to talk about that than I am. It's been unbelievable progress. I don't know if we could have ever predicted this, the speed at which we're making our fixtures higher efficacy. And we can also see that happening on the regulation side where power density regulations are coming down and becoming stricter and harder to meet. I think that's something that's very top of mind for most electrical engineers and lighting designers, people who have to deal with those issues. Absolutely, that's helped. And, and that's helping on the operational side, uh, operational carbon. On the embodied carbon side, we have some more work to do. And one of the things that's important to note is that we're reaching the theoretical limit of efficacy of LED lightings. You're, you're seeing some products out there that are climbing north of 200 lumens per watt. Uh, so it's, it, we're going to reach a point. I think we have reached a point of diminishing returns in investing in trying to. All right, let's start to transition to kind of what's next, start looking to the future. So Benjamin, I want you to imagine a world where lighting, and you can think of other construction you know, materials as well, but where lighting is built in a more sustainable manner. What does that world look like to you? Yeah, what, what I dream of and envision is that we'll flip the industry on its head. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, right now, metal and plastic are the primary materials for lighting. I would like them to be thought of as specialty materials and wood and organic material is considered decorative or specialty or niche. I would love organic sustainable materials to become the standard. And so that's what I, I dream of. And I now know for a fact that it's feasible. Back when we first started our sustainable design journey, I wasn't sure that organic sustainable materials could keep up with, you know, metals and plastics. There's a reason we're using metals and plastics. Now, a few years into the journey, uh, I am more confident than ever that sustainable materials are actually better at most things than metals and plastics are. And I'm bullish and I want to share that with as many people as possible that you can make higher performance fixtures with better efficacy and better light output with no toxic materials, no plastics, no metals other than the electrical components. Um, so now that I've, I have convinced myself, uh, that it's, it's possible. And really it's our engineering team who's done that. Uh, I want to convince everybody else as well. And I think there's a really strong value proposition. So I, that's what I envision for the future. Well, how do you, how do we get there? Yeah. So, you know, from the absolute highest level, someone needs to create demand for sustainable products and someone needs to create a supply. Now, I think from a manufacturer's perspective, it's always great if the demand comes first. Uh, and when I say demand, I mean lighting designers and architects and interior designers and electrical engineers, the project design team, whoever specifying the lighting, if they were to require sustainability documentation and or a certain level of sustainability within that system on all of their projects, that would eventually encourage enough manufacturers to invest in sustainable design that they would have those options. Right now in lighting, if you request that type of documentation or make those types of requirements, they will be unfulfilled by the majority of the lighting manufacturers and products that are out there. But you just asking for them uh, puts pressure on. And imagine a manufacturer's regional and rep go into five, 10 different meetings, and in six or eight of them, they're being asked for EPDs. That's going to help encourage the manufacturer to know we need to do this. and and. I think I'm recommending that first because I don't like to wait on public policy. I have no idea how long that's going to take, but I think this is an instant change the design community can make to show their intent and demand for sustainable products that will increase the supply of sustainable product options and then make it actually more feasible that you can do a sustainable lighting project. Uh, and we need more supply but it's not going to happen without the demand. And so my opinion is that the demand should come first. The design community the owners should make requirements. And frankly, they already are. You saw uh, Gensler, the biggest AE firm in the world, publish uh, their design standards, their, their sustainability standards for their company. 
and what they're going to require in terms of carbon dioxide reporting and material sustainability information for every one of their projects. So now we have the biggest in the world doing this. That means it's only a matter of time before more and more people jump on. That'll create the demand, which will then encourage the supply. Uh, and I think, I don't know how long that's going to take, but as that's all happening, public policy is going to catch up and it will become law. And so in the meantime, it's up to us to encourage each other to do the right thing. And then eventually, I believe it will become policy. Uh, so can you share with me some of the struggles that uh, Lightly, the company you're with uh, currently, yeah. uh, faced as they develop their, their products? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, the engineering team has the best, uh, most detailed answer to this, but I can give you some perspective from, from where I was looking from. You know, we decided to make our products out of biodegradable materials, uh, poplar wood and wool, sheep's wool. And one of the challenges we faced is exactly what you would expect, which is wood uh, has different wood species and the different wood species grow in different places and they behave differently in different climates. And so we had to do well over a year of testing in humidity tents and with different climates and heat levels uh, on multiple different species of wood. And we actually redesigned our fixture at least four times in four different species of wood uh, before we landed on poplar, where we are now, and everything we make is poplar. So one of the challenges we faced is how do we keep it straight? How does it handle humidity? How, uh, how over time does it change color? How does the light engine adhere to wood instead of metal? So it's, you know, the materiality presented some challenges you would expect. And thankfully, we found something from Mother Nature that could handle all those difficult situations. And it was poplar. And that's why it's no surprise poplar is used in a lot of different applications in architecture, from crown moldings to wall and ceiling systems. So that, that was one challenge. Um, another more specific challenge that we faced is our products, we committed to not putting any plastic in any of our products. And most light fixtures create their light distribution using plastic optics and plastic diffusers. And so we had to figure out how do we create all the common light distributions that people would expect uh, without the main tool that manufacturers use to shape the light. And so we figured it out and we use internal reflection instead. Instead of having the light engine and then the diffuser with optics, we reflect the light off the internal profile of the fixture to get the same light distribution. And here's a great example of where sustainable design actually created something better because we don't have plastic or any other medium for the light to pass through, more light enters the space. And it cre increases the efficacy of the final fixture and its light output. And so we're not only that, removing components, which means lower supply chain risk, faster to build, cheaper to build. So it has all of these great advantages by really refining it to its key components. But at the time, we were like, how are we going to solve, solve these problems? And it took a lot of playing from our engineering team to get to something. And kudos to them not just doing good enough, but actually raising the bar and making it more sustainable at the same time. So many of our listeners are contractors. Can you share some of the advantages they might see in using these kinds of products? Yeah, uh, probably what would be most interesting uh, to contractors is that our company hasn't missed a ship date in over two years. So if you're a contractor experiencing delays on your lighting, uh, we've been doing a really, really excellent job getting things out on time. And kudos to Chris, our head of engineering and the whole production team and operations team for making that happen. I shouldn't really take much credit for that. Uh, the other thing that contractors might be interested in is our fixtures are half the weight of a metal fixture. So you can lift it much more easily. It's cheaper and easier to handle and move the material around. Uh, and I remember one of the first installations we did for, for Lightly, the contractor at the time was putting up like an eight foot aluminum and plastic linear. And we distracted him, got him down off his ladder and said, Hey, can you install this one next? And we handed him the Lightly butterfly. 
And he was going on and on and on about how he, how, how light it was and how easy it was to hold above his head. He, he was holding up an eight foot fixture above his head with one hand and, mm. and doing something else with his other hand. So that's, he taught me about that value proposition. I, I didn't come up with that one. Uh, and I'm glad if it's delighting to you as a contractor, great. I hope we can make your life a little easier. I think, uh, and, and this would not necessarily be true with every sustainable product, but I think in the case of Lightly, it's, they're all made here in the U.S. Is that correct? Yeah. If, if, a, if buy American or just American supporting your local economy is important to you, which is very important to us as a firm, you know, we're based in Philadelphia. Uh, it's hard to go to Philadelphia without looking around and seeing what used to be one of the most prominent manufacturing economies in the entire world. And that was before I was born, but the buildings are still there just falling apart. And so I can't, I would be lying if I didn't say a part of me really wants to rebuild piece of a piece of that manufacturing economy in the United States with American supply chains and American talent and support our local economy as most, as much as possible. It does bother me a little bit that some of the components for lighting don't have supply chains in the United States. And we're dependent for these are things we need. And we're dependent on places far away uh, that don't necessarily have the same value systems that we have here. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. If you want an American product, everything we make is by American, B-A-B-A, like all, all those programs. But more importantly, we're trying as much as possible to localize our supply chain and our team. Uh, I wanted to ask what else manufacturers, concerned building owners, contractors can do to bring sustainable products more to the forefront of you know project decision makers. You know, if you understand the basics, then the next step is to make commitments, to take responsibility. From the design side, that means make a commitment not to specify products that are unsustainable. Or if that's not feasible, request sustainability documentation for everything and whenever possible, specify the most sustainable option. For manufacturer, that means start to explore alternative materials. Use our company as a benchmark, take what we've done and try and leap ahead of us. That's, that's competition is going to create more options for the design community. It's going to create better pricing for them eventually. And that'll help us prepare as an industry for a sustainable future, which we're currently unprepared for. Um, you know, there's also a lot of initiatives going on that are, that are already happening. Like you, like we mentioned Gensler, but big firms like Perkins and Will, uh, have their own sustainability and material, uh, you know, material identification and toxicity list. And there's the AIA materials pledge and mindful materials in the lighting community specifically. There's the life cycle analysis incubator, the green light alliance, and we're creating product category rules to help create data standards for measuring the sustainability of lighting and, and making it easier to make apple to apples comparisons between products. But underlying all of this, there needs to be demand. And that's what's going to lead to supply. Well, Benjamin, this has been a great conversation and uh, opened my eyes to a different way of thinking about like sustainability and construction. So I appreciate that. Um, but I would like to refocus on the why of what we do. I'd like to hear that from my guests. So what motivates you to do this day in and day out? What keeps you excited and passionate about what you do? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a hard uphill battle. And it's, it's on one hand, uh, exhausting. And on the other hand, it feels like a sense of responsibility. Uh, it feels like this is something our, our industry needs to do and happens to be the right timing to start to lead in this regard. And aside from me feeling a sense of responsibility and this being the right thing to do, I also have the additional motivation of an enormous business opportunity. You know, th this is the wave that's coming. And it's not just my business opportunity. Anybody who's listening to this right now, this is an, an opportunity for you as well. This is the very beginning of sustainability journey for the lighting industry. If you're a lighting designer, you can be one of the first experts and thought leaders in sustainability and lighting right now. If you start to learn now and you can build your own brand and community as a thought leader, uh, for, uh, for manufacturers, you will be one of the first manufacturers to publish an EPD still. 
for lighting, for the lighting industry. And that makes you stand out. If you're, you know, in, 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 in addition to all the other ways your products are standing out, uh, if you are a contractor or distributor and you want to substitute products and you're recommending sustainable things, maybe the design team will like your substitution option better than what they originally specified. You know, there's the, the key thing here is that there's the right thing to do, which is investing in sustainability and sustainable information and documentation and material transparency. And then there's a business opportunity on top of that to build your company, no matter what it is, and yourself as a leader in lighting sustainability. And that could stick with you for the rest of your career. Uh, so this is only gaining more and more traction. So whether you care about global warming or you care about financial gain, there's something here for both of for both of those groups of people or people who care about both. And I can't tell you how much of an opportunity there is. It, it's really worth it. And that helps to motivate me as well. Uh, so hopefully that in, motivates some others in, to, to get interested. <laughs> Well, Benjamin, thank you so much for being here. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to help ask questions and share the story. Well, that was my conversation with Benjamin Rapkin, General Manager at Lightly. You can connect with Benjamin and what he's working on by heading to the links in the show notes. What I'm taking away from this conversation is that I really want to start thinking about the products that are going into the buildings that we're working on. How does the entire life cycle impact us today and future generations? Take a look at the show notes for links where I share sustainability standards, material pledges, and ideas on how we can move forward with more sustainable materials and designs. If you enjoyed this episode, you can help us grow this show by subscribing or following and leaving a five-star rating in your favorite podcast player. Thanks for listening to this episode of Keeping the Lights On. We'll see you next time.